welcome everyone to the 15th uh, ELOC uh, session. And today we have an honor to have a, a speaker from Tampere University, Tomi Jaakkola. And we have had quite a series of talks before and now I will let you know like what the schedule is first. Tommy will give us a, a about 45 minute talk. And then after uh, then after Erno and Tommy will be reflecting on the topic. And after that, we will have a short breakout room discussion, small group discussion about a topic that Tommy has been has given. And then there will be a little wrap up and a closing session. Overall, this will take about one hour and 30 minutes. So Tommy will present today about uh, simulations and external rep representations in science and math learning and how to support learning transfer and interest. And this is very um, cool opportunity for us all because uh, Tommy's background is uh, in teaching and he has been doing bio pioneering work on simulations and bringing up together different forms of representations and how to use those efficiently in, especially in online teaching and in, in uh, these kinds of simulation surroundings and in science topic, but also as we have noticed together that uh, we have combining topics and themes also in the math area. So Tommy and I have had a shared uh, PhD student, Gabriela Rodriguez, with Erno as well, and um, we are really happy to have you here and congratulate Erno for your birthday, that was quite a while ago already, and also Tommy for your associate professorship in Tampere. <laughs> so uh, Tommy um, defended her, his uh, PhD thesis under supervision of Erno in 2012, and you can see the title there. And that was the time when we were, we, we saw each other quite often times in the Educarium building in Turku. And then I asked a little bit about uh, what else do you do or what else has been um, important for you in life. And there's a little hint in the, this pictorial representation. <laughs> so I wonder, is that true that you have been playing tennis in a quite top level even? Okay. Yes, that is, of course, yeah. But, uh, but that's uh, been a long time ago, like uh, <laughs> many years ago. But yeah, I won some Finnish championships in tennis. So I was quite serious about that back then. But. Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. Now I now I have uh, kind of returned back to that. I, I play with my sons oh, okay. every every Sunday. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. But uh, we have learned to know you as a very kind of a, a um, dedicated researcher and um, um, internationally very widely uh, collaborating researcher. Uh, when you were still in Turku. And today, just to let you know, I noticed that there's still your mailbox, uh, mailbox with your name <laughs> in Educario. So we are, I think, secret, secretly hoping that we would get you back someday. So <laughs> there's already a mailbox <laughs> waiting for you. So welcome. It's wonderful to have you, have you here. And I actually will let you take the floor or the screen now. Welcome, Tommy. Okay, thank you, Minna, for the, uh, for, for, for this, uh, and of course, for also Erna for, for this invi invitation and for this opportunity to, uh, to uh, kind of celebrate Erna's career, long, long, uh, uh, career, but uh, also to, this is a nice opportunity for me to present some of uh, some of uh, my research that also something that uh, what I have done also with in collaboration with Erno and also in collaboration with with, with other colleagues. So 
Yes, I, 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 uh, I, I appreciate this opportunity. Okay, but uh, so um, as Minna already mentioned, my uh, the title of my talk today is use of external representations uh, in science and math learning, how to support learning and transfer and interest. Although I, I, my main focus today is on, on science and math learning, but I, I think this, uh, I know that represent, uh, different kind of representations are, are used in, in all kinds of topics. So I, I think this kind of, uh, this, this kind of topic is, it's, is much broader, but, but uh, since uh, these are kind of, um, science is my main topic. And, and as Minna said, we have collaborated a bit on, on math learning as well. And, and, and since uh, I, I know that uh, for at least in the latter part of Erno's career, math has been the kind of the main focus. So I thought that it would be kind of appropriate and, and also interesting to <coughs> include kind of some math examples in, in my talk. And also, I think that there is an important relationship between math and science in the sense that uh, that uh, kind of uh, math overall is quite abstract, but science is kind of one context where you one kind of practical context where you need to need to kind of apply your uh, apply uh, different kinds of math. Uh, little bit about the background. <coughs> of this presentation. So in, in our increasingly multimedia centric society, the use of different kinds of external representations in learning, teaching and communication has increased dramatically. And as a result, uh, there is an increasing need to use and interpret a large variety of external representational forms, some of which are more concrete than others. And, and as a result, also to understand how different forms shape learning. So in, in, in my today's talk, I will examine uh, the benefits and challenges of concrete and abstract external representations in teaching and learning, and particularly from the perspective of learning, transfer, and interest. So uh, here is a kind of example or kind of framework that what I will be using today. So, so uh, there are different kind of categorizations, but this is quite commonly used categorization. So on the left hand side, you can see kind of representations or like learning materials that have a physical form. Then in the middle, there are there are the same kind of same representations or this pictorial form that refer to this physical, this concrete object. So there is a, you can see the kind of slice of there on the, on the physical form, there is a kind of real image of real pizza. Then it's a drawing of pizza. And then there are like, if we use this pizza, so, or images of pizzas to learn, like, for instance, like fractions, then there are corresponding symbolic forms. And, they, and the same kind of <coughs> holds for, for learning sciences, for instance, in this case, electric circuit, so we can have a real electric circuit, so in, in physical form, so something like really tangible, then we can have a, the drawings of, of, of circuits, and then we have in symbolic forms, like like this these formulas formulas and then when we, so these kind of different representations they they can be put on the on a on a kind of concrete abstract continuum or they form the concrete abstract con, uh, continuum so this physical uh, the, so this real uh, real objects physical form that forms the kind of the concrete end of, of the continuum. And, and this symbolic, the symbolic form, they, they represent the kind of abstract end of the continuum. And, but then you can have multiple different kind of represent, representations there in between. For instance, these, uh, <coughs> like on the left-hand side, you can see the, like the pizza that has these dots, they can be kind of the dot, like for instance, they are representing salami slices. It's a little bit more kind of real-like 
pizza than than the than the next one and the same holds for these electric circuits there that here is a drawing that you can kind of i would say immediately recognize as as a representation of real circuits whereas on the right hand side uh, this semantic circuit it's kind of convention uh, that uh, it's already more abstract so you need to know what these kind of different symbols mean in order to in order to understand those those forms uh, but overall i think that when when we use different representations in in teaching and learning i, I think it's it's often not meaningful to kind of just to make these things a bit between concrete and abstract or they are not necessarily that one is concrete and the other is abstract but i think it's it's more like relative that one material may be more abstract than the other or the other way around that something is more concrete than than the other so uh, it is actually very difficult to define uh, exactly if a material is concrete or abstract but i i'm not going to I don't have enough time to go into the details of this matter today. Then something like, uh, I thought that it's useful to start with some more formal definitions. So concrete representation has identifiable correspondences with its reference and is recognizable and understandable based on everyday experiences uh, and, and words like specific modal equivalent example or episode are, are typically associated with concrete representations uh, whereas abstract representations communicate abstract representation communicates minimal extraneous details beyond the defining structural information and is is more or not at all linked to its referent and terms like generic a model distinctive rule or prototype are typically associated with with abstract representations uh, there are also other other kind of corresponding terms that you if you search the literature uh, for instance there's uh, <coughs> kaminski and colleagues they use also concrete representation but they 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 use word generic term generic instead of abstract representation there's concrete idealized grounded formal indirect direct and descriptive and depictive uh, they all kind of uh, go under the same un un umbrella and i think the selection of terminology kind of depends uh, depends on 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 mostly i would say on the topic topic of the of the research but they all mean the same thing but but in today's talk i will i will use the terms concrete and abstract so each or both representations they have kind of uh, specific strengths and weaknesses concrete the strengths of concrete representations are that they are more easy to understand and they can activate prior knowledge which, which has been shown in especially in the research of on conceptual change that it's very important to activate prior knowledge not only to accumulate knowledge but also kind of activate misconceptions then it is also often claimed that concrete materials are more engaging but i think there's not really that much empirical evidence on that that the concrete materials would be uh, would be more engaging than abstract ones on the downside uh, sometimes uh, concrete representations they can be too specific because they they include uh, irrelevant contextual details which compete for attention with the deep to be learned structure which means that you don't uh, as a novice learner you non, you may not und, you may not be under, able to understand what is kind of imp, kind of what is uh, really like important in the context of what, what, what represents the, the do, domain structure and as a result uh, it is often and there's a lot of actually empirical evidence also that that sometimes if if your learning is kind of too contextualized it is difficult to transfer which means that to apply that knowledge into new contexts uh, the benefits of abstract representations 
are that they emphasize the core attributes and structure, and they are kind of more generic. So you, your your focus is on the on the kind of the underlying principles, which means that they apply to many particular instances, and and they are also designed for transfer. Because if if you learn a kind of outcome is is more generic knowledge, that means that you should be able to apply to that that to multiple contexts. But the kind of downside or the danger is that abstract uh, representations are often more difficult to understand and kind of paradoxically they may result also in isolated understanding or kind of uh, contextualized understanding which means that uh, you may learn some some abstract rule but you don't you are unable to associate that that uh, knowledge to to any concrete cases i will have a uh, in a couple of slides, I will have some uh, examples of that. So here is again uh, the the this same representation. So indeed, let's there's also, for instance, research evidence that <clears throat> that although it's e very easy to understand, kind of uh, or immediately understand what this is about if you learn with the real electric circuits. But but even on university level, students often wonder that you see, you can pro hopefully see there that there are different colors of wires. So they students wonder that whether this uh, uh, color of wire has uh, has uh, some function in the uh, in the functioning of the circuit. So whether it means that if the uh, wire is red or or white, whether that has so. Uh, uh, an impact on the functioning. The same goes with that if you are presented a picture of real pizza, you, may, you that may distract your thoughts that you may start kind of uh, uh, desiring pizza or thinking pizza uh, eating context instead of focusing on, on fractions, for instance. And the other way around that if we move towards the more abstract representations, that means that uh, <coughs> that they may be more difficult to understand. For instance, I, I, I know, for instance, that in mathematics uh, teaching, you basically, with small children, you need to start from this big, at least from this pictorial forms that you can't immediately start from this symbolic form because it's too demanding. Same holds for, for different science concepts, that it's not very useful to start from this symbolic form, but you need to kind of progress from more from the concrete towards more abstract uh, <clears throat> while i will focus on 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 this physical pictorial and symbolic form I, I just thought that it's important to also illustrate that uh, uh, that even words can be kind of more concrete some words are more concrete than the others for instance there's a alan paivio uh, who kind of developed this dual coding uh, 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 theory? Uh, they did uh, uh, kind of groundbreaking or, or piloting work on different repress uh, on on words, and they found that some words are those words that have uh, like a, uh, like a have also like a uh, real. Uh, have a real correspondence in real life. For instance, bulb. You can have a picture of bulb, and, and then you have a bulbs also in real life. Those are easier to remember than more abstract words that don't have a correspondence. For instance, voltage. I think the reason why, why many scientific concepts are difficult to learn, part of that is that, for instance, uh, for voltage, there is there is really like no pictorial form or physical form. It's so abstract concept. Uh, the same held for current for many years, but now, for instance, <clears throat> thanks for the development of different computer technologies. Uh, here is a picture of computer simulation, and you can see there that with uh, they can, simulations can augment reality. So. They can make these abstract concepts more, kind of more, little bit more concrete. So we can visualize 
the current flow or electron flow flows so it makes more the concept more concrete but but this is really not my my field of expertise but i i thought that it's important to to kind of emphasize that even all words are because they are in symbolic form they are as a starting point they are all uh, abstract but but also that some some words are, are more abstract than others and, and and that's why it is difficult to learn these scientific concepts here are some more x and i have some more examples about uh, concrete and abstract representations or task here is a famous base and selection task in abstract context so you are a clerk and your job is to make sure that the documents conform the following rule so if a person has a d rating then this, his document must be marked code three so how, what, what cards so you have a letter on one side of the card and a number on the other side so the question is that you need to indicate only those cards that you definitely need to turn over to so, uh, to see if the documents of any of these people violate these rules. So the question is that which cards you should kind of check. So many students struggle or on university level and, and, and basically on any level struggle with this task in this abstract context, but when they are given much the same problem but in a, in a concrete familiar context, so you are a bouncer in a bar and you need to confirm the rule that if the person is drinking a beer, then he must be over 20 years old. So then it becomes much easier. So of course, you if you see a person who is drinking a beer, uh, you will of course check whether he or she is, uh, meets the rule that so he's 20 years old and quite automatically also check that the person that is 16 year old that what, what is he or she drinking so the same rule would applies to this abstract uh, example but uh, but uh, but it has been shown that uh, uh, about from 4 to 15 percent of students are able to solve the abstract problem whereas the proposal is something like 73 uh, fourths or so 75 percent in in case of this abstract example but of course we can still question that do they actually le learn the generic rule from this concrete case or not or not because there's also other research that if we change this concrete problem context uh, the result if, if that concrete context is not familiar to learners then uh, it, it is not helping learning here is another other example uh, uh, this is a quite simple circuit task. So this question has been administered to, to more than 500 uh, university students. And, and when this question has been asked on a course exam examinations, about 10% uh, of the students in algebra-based algebra courses and 15% of the students in calculus-based courses are able to correctly rank the bulbs so even on university level but to compare the relative brightness uh, you actually don't need need any calculus uh, but, but only kind of it is sufficient to reason qualitatively so so the result for instance here would be that a d and e are equal and they are brighter than b and c so that shows that uh, this is serves as an example that if you learn this abstract knowledge and you are but you are unable to connect that to kind of real circuits or, or you are unable to uh, map uh, this quantitative knowledge with qualitative knowledge uh, that that quantitative uh, knowledge that you have learned is not not very useful so here is another uh, actually very famous example that was uh, Kaminsky and colleagues published a study in 2008 where they uh, investigated uh, or compared the effect that uh, the, so the target was to learn a, commu a commutative mathematical group of order three 
uh, and with generic symbols or with concrete symbols. So they actually had three concrete conditions. So you can see here bottom. So you, they had either measuring cups, pictures of pizza and tennis balls in a container. So they, they first learned this either in a generic or in, in concrete condition. And then they found that the learning in these conditions was equally good. But then when they measured transfer, they found out that, uh, that this generic, they used the term generic, but, but this abstract representation, learning with abstract representation was, was superior. However, they so 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 as a as a because of these results, they concluded that if you want to uh, have a good transfer in mathematics, you should use uh, abstract representations. But they their research has also received a lot of criticism. For instance, it it has been claimed that the transfer task is more similar to the generic instance instantiation than to concrete ones. In the transfer task, those participants in the generic condition had only to map three symbols onto three other symbols in the proper order and then perform operations with the new symbols in ways precisely analogous to the ones they did earlier. Whereas in concrete condition, uh, they had, students had a more, more substantial task of trying to operate with relatively abstract symbols in the transfer, the transfer task for the first time. So their reliance on quantity in the transfer task was not useful and could in fact have embedded in their progress on the transfer task. So what that means is that uh, basically uh, here is a, we, we, when you so, try to solve or learn these, these rules with these measuring cups, these concrete representations, you can I think quite automatically you start kind of operating with quantities on or with numbers. For instance, you can say use fractions to represent these or, or, or any kind of these combinations. Whereas with these abstract representations, here you don't, they don't invite you to use kind of uh, quantities or numbers. And, and the same holds for, for this transfer domain. So for instance, if you would have a, this problem that you have three circles and the question is that what's the what's the leftover this is kind of stepwise process that you should follow and find out that this is the kind of final outcome or, or the or the leftover and if you would follow the same procedure in the concrete representation of course you would kind of come up with the with the same uh, kind of with the same, of course, with different representation, but with the same outcome, and you would learn the same rule. But I think in reality, because this is for they their target um, or their participants were university students, so it is of course obviously you don't you don't need to use this kind of strategy, this kind of formal strategy, but you would rather put two one-thirds, three one-thirds together, it's a full, full cup and then two-thirds from here or use some kind of other, other calculation. So, so you actually learn quite different rules that you, you focus on the kind of numerosity here in the concrete example and, and not, not, not here in the, in the abstract example. So this, uh, this uh, study has been kind of replicated. Uh, there has been replication studies, uh, many replication studies. And here is, for instance, one interesting study. So uh, De Bock and colleagues, they did the same, had the same design. So abstract, abstract, and concrete, abstract. This is the same as Kaminsky. But what they added is from condition that from abstract to concrete and concrete to concrete. So they had different transfer domains. So they, for these original conditions, they got the same. If you look at these numbers and the Kaminsky, Kaminsky's original numbers, they are basically the same. So in also in their study, 
uh, transfer to abstract domain was bet much better in the from the abstract condition but the other it was the other way around so that, so that from from concrete to concrete so transfer was actually better from concrete to concrete than from, than from abstract to concrete so so this shows that the the the, the main point of this this study was to show that their their measurements were not not kind of accurate or they they were favoring the abstract abstract condition then there is a more recent study by Trinik and colleagues. Uh, they they also added this formal uh, formal transfer domain there. But also what did what they changed is the, is this kind of little bit this during this learning because I think it's counterintuitive that for instance if you have if you would have two thirds and two thirds, then you you have left over one third. But if you have this one third and two third in the original form, the leftover is this full, whereas I think this is intuitively kind of more, more correct to have it like this. So they got also a little bit different results. So they actually found that the concrete condition was much higher on learning. So that's different than in Kaminsky's, Kaminsky study, but also that transfer to this this formal transfer was also higher higher here so i think that overall uh, this kind of leaves a, a bit like a question mark on the on the whole question that that uh, in mathematics that what, what is kind of more beneficial because i think based on this de box study you could still argue that actually abstract is more beneficial because domain uh, transfer from abstract to abstract and abstract to concrete they are quite on quite high level whereas this is clearly kind of you know, maybe not harmful but not as effective from concrete to abstract but then these these results are these uh, uh, newer results they actually indicate that concrete would be better but it is a little bit uh, open i would say Then I will move uh, to multiple external representations. So if we think that uh, from those results that, uh, uh, and from, from earlier discussion that uh, concrete representations some have specific strengths and so do abstracts, but they both have also weaknesses. So, so the idea of multiple representations is that when, when you combine the representations, complement one another and produce better learning outcomes than any representation alone. So, so and in the case of concrete and abstract representations, so the more minimalistic design of abstract representations, which is geared towards transfer, can constrain the interpretation of concrete representation and direct attention towards relevant domain features. And since abstract representations are more difficult to understand, the strength of concrete representations is that they can bridge the gap between the abstract and of reality. So that would be the rationale to, for combining concrete and abstract. And then there is also more broader research on multiple rep uh, representations and on, on uh, D.D. Kentner's result, uh, research uh, on analogical encoding, which shows that uh, that comparison of multiple overlapping representations can promote better understanding than learning with single representation. <clears throat> but uh, it, it is of course important to understand and, and notice that the multiple that the benefits of multiple representations that they are not self-evident and there are risks and costs involved that if learners are, for instance, required to divide attention between multiple representations, this may increase the task workload and interfere with learning. And learners may also fail to extract the key concept. So, so if they are not able to recognize that, that these two representations are connected and they, they represent the same phenomena. At least theoretically, it should be, however, noted that even if the comparison would not result in a unified understanding, 
multiple represent representations could still promote transfer more effectively than a single representation because each individual representation can serve as a potential reference in a le new learning situation. And this here is a technique uh, called concreteness fading, which is a kind of special case of multiple representations. Uh, concreteness fading is according to Fife and Nathan, a theory of instruction intended to facilitate connections among, among multiple representations by progressing from more concrete to more uh, abstract with the goal of supporting transfer of the concept. And, and Fife and, and colleagues, they argue that the ma major advantage of this method or the sequencing re multiple representations relative to using them simult simultaneously is that sequencing reduces cognitive effort since it's not necessary to hold different representations in mind simultaneously or make exp exp explicit comparisons between them. But there, there is also critique uh, towards this claim that uh, when representations are used sequentially in isolation, then students' understanding relies on a single representation at the time and the mapping of information between the representations will be heavily dependent on, on memory retrieval, which is cognitively sensitive and computationally demanding process. Here, uh, <clears throat> so here is an illustration of how, how concreteness fading theoretically overcomes the problem of transfer in comparison of learning with concrete or abstract representations alone. Uh, if we start here from the bottom, we can, if we, if we learn from with concrete representations, the transfer to other concrete representations is relatively easy, whereas kind of the distance to abstract representations is, is bigger and it's more difficult to tr transfer to abstract representations. And the, the reverse holds for, for abs when learning with abstract representations. So, it's easier to transfer to other abstract representations and more demanding to transfer to concrete representations. So if you use multiple representations, for instance, this concreteness fading technique on theoretical level, since you experience different kinds of representations, you should be able to transfer to any kind of representation. But I think the problem in, in, in the current uh, currently is that in quite often the measurements are kind of limited to this abstract representation. So kind of researchers are satisfied that when you, are, when you have good results regarding the abstract representation. But uh, as I saw, for instance, this McDermott's research on electric circuits, that it is equally important to be able to transfer to different kinds of representation. So that, that is clearly a limitation. Here are some empirical uh, results regarding concreteness fading. <clears throat> For instance, McNeil and Five, they've, they also replicated this Kaminsky study, and they found that uh, actually this concreteness fading they start uh, when when learners started with uh, with these concrete objects, measuring cups, then Roman numerals, and then to these abstract symbols. They outperformed this generic condition or abstract condition, and also this multiple concrete condition. But uh, so while I think this result uh, kind of shows that this fading was better than this abstract, but I, I think it is a little bit question, questionable that this, because they use multiple concrete, I think the use of kind of concrete or single representation, the diffic difficulty with, with uh, these uh, uh, multiple representations is that you need to be able to connect them. So, so I think, and if you think, we also think of these transfer measurements uh, that I think they were not that favorable, or they were least favorable to this concrete condition. But I think this, this research nevertheless shows at least that the fading was better at transfer than, than the abstract condition. 
Similar results have been obtained also in science learning. For instance, Colston and Son, some quite already quite long, 15 years ago, uh, they did a study where they had actually four conditions. So only concrete, only abstract or concreteness fading where they started with concrete representations and then switched to this more abstract. And the fourth condition, they start so-called concreteness introduction. You start with the abstract representation and then move, move towards concrete. And their result was that this is the first the learning phase. These multiple representation conditions were better than single representation conditions. And, and you should also pay attention that these represent error bars. So shorter bar means better learning outcomes. And <laughs> the difference was especially notable uh, in, in transfer task, in pattern learning. So this concreteness fading was, was superior to any other condition, also better than this, this concreteness introduction condition. So, so these results, uh, these two example studies illustrate that indeed combining multiple representations can be beneficial both in mathematics and, and science learning. <clears throat> then I will uh, move uh, to our own research on, on different representations. These, uh, these studies we have selected, uh, I have here selected, uh, here we have compared learning outcomes from learning this concrete representation, concrete me refers here to this learning with bulbs, and then how we have used as a comparison group, a fading condition. So you start with bulbs and then you move towards resistors. And, and our target group here has been, we have had different age students. So age group from 10 to 15. So a little bit younger students than, than those studies that I, I have presented earlier. And I think before I go into, into our, our results that I think it's important or interesting, I would say to mention that from the physics point of view, uh, bulbs and resistors, they are equally concrete. So, but, but I think that uh, an important dimension on this concrete abstract continuum is, is, is also familiarity. That even though if you have a concrete, representation of bulbs and concrete representation of resistors, it may be that they are not equally concrete to learners, because if you don't know what the cons what, what this represents, for instance, resistors, then I would say that it is more abstract for, for from a learner's point of view. So here are the here are the results of, of or here is actually set up and, and the results of one of our more recent studies. So we had seventh and eighth graders indeed that, so we compared this, this we labeled concrete condition and this was fading condition. Here are some example test items that we use. So as I kind of said earlier that we should try to have as broad measurement as possible. So we try to have, so these are kind of, these could be labeled this near transfer items because they are very similar to, to this simulation. So this learning environment. So these are then further transfer items and these we labeled as isomorphic. So these are, these at least look different than the representations that have been used during learning, so that they are not bulbs, but they are something different. So on different level and, and, and kind of to uh, assure the fa uh, fairness of, of the comparison between conditions. So first, what we should see from this pretest uh, and why I have it here is that overall results that, that before the instruction, the understanding on bulb circuits, both on real, semantic and realistic level, is higher on bulbs. Understanding of bulb circuits is better than resistor circuits, which shows that indeed for students, 
valves and resistors are not equally uh, concrete or abstract. Another thing <coughs> during the learning time, I have highlighted here with the red, that this is the time when they swap or switch from bulbs to resistors. And this same task, when they used only bulbs, it took less time. So clearly it's not kind of, a, they needed to put some additional effort there on learning when they transferred the representation. So I think this result kind of indicates that, that if you have multiple representation, it takes time to adjust and, and map those representations. But then about these learning outcomes, we found regarding semantic circuits, we found no differences between the conditions, but a concrete condition here, we, you can see they outperform the fading condition uh, on, on these realistic circuits. And what was also interesting that since this concrete condition, they didn't, uh, learn with these resistor circuits at all, they still did equally well on res resistor circuits than, than this fading condition. So we, in our study, we didn't find any benefit of the, uh, you could say that we didn't see any advantage of using multiple representations. So what could be an explanation why our results are, seem to be different than than those of Colston and Son, for instance, or, or those that McNeil and Five study in mathematics. So, of course, one explanation is that we had a bit younger students, uh, which may mean that uh, it was more difficult for them to connect the rep to representations. But another other, uh, difference is that especially compared to this McNeil and Five, is that these simulations that we have used in our, our studies, that is a more, that is a kind of dynamic representation. So that actually combines, so it is semantic, so the appearance is semantic, but like in real physical circuits, you can actually, you can construct the circuits, you can measure the circuits, and it's of course difficult to see here, but depending on the configuration of the circuit, the brightness of the bulbs will change. So there is also this dynamic bulb brightness aspect. So we think that this kind of dynamic intermediate representation can be actually quite useful in, in uh, that it can kind of have very similar purposes as, as the fading with multiple representations. So that, 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 that is a potential explanation for, for these differing outcomes. Then uh, about uh, one of our, our earlier study studies where we compared actually, oh, sorry about that. Now, yeah. So where we actually compared, uh, real learning with real circuits against learning with simulation against combining. And here we used actually, here we didn't use this concreteness fading, but they had them both representations in the combination environment available simultaneously. So that was a little bit different kind of, kind of use of multiple representations. And there what we found is that actually in that case, uh, this uh, use of multiple representations was better than the simulation and also better than real circuits. And although the results from the simulation environment were better than from real circuits, this difference was not significant. But in this case, the combination was better. So there are... <laughs> We may, of course, question or the obvious question is why, why these results are different. So one, what I already said, one, one uh, difference is that in, in the earlier study, we had the sequential combination and here we had the parallel combination. And another difference is that I would say that it's easier to map. So here you have re or 
real circuits, re real bulb circuits and virtual bulb circuits, they are much more kind of more similar than if we have a virtual bulb circuit and a virtual resistor circuit, because you will, then you have different components. So that may be another explanation that it is actually easier to map to so real and virtual bulbs than, than virtual bulbs and, and resistors. And here are, here are some, some uh, we, we video recorded this, and here are some, uh, some uh, exp, uh, excerpts of, uh, from, from those video data that show some of the kind of benefits of using multiple representations. For instance, here they have created this single bulb circuit and have measured the bulb voltages with real. Then they go to real circuits. They measure and they are not exactly the same, uh, but, uh, but with the help of teacher, they kind of come to understanding why that is the case. But then uh, the, there's not enough space to go, go into more details. But then this one of the students goes back to after. So he has first, build the circuit with the simulation, then he builds identical circuit with the real equipment, and then again goes to back to simulation to adjust the simulation voltage to match this. So I think <clears throat> this is an example where this kind of analogical encoding takes place that, 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 that you really like focus on comparing these representations. And here is a similar example that they have uh, constructed a more complex uh, virtual circuit. And that serves as a point of reference when they, when they start building this uh, real, uh, real circuit. And, and that helps them to understand even why, why the circuit may be correct, even the bulbs don't lie, uh, light because the, the, it's, uh, the, the amount of current is so, so low. Then, uh, as a final thing, uh, I promise to say something about interest. Why, why, why we are inter interested also in interest in, 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 in this context. So overall, it has been shown that interest has positive influences on various aspects of learning. But actually, what is also interesting that the relationship between interest and learning outcomes is not clear. But the main reason why we want to focus on interest and why I think it is important to focus on interest is that both in science and mathematics, but also in other domains, we have seen a kind of decline in pupils' interest. So it is important to design learning environments that do not only produce good learning outcomes, but are also engaging from students' perspective. And there's also evidence that that actually the, their learning experiences in science, in school, are, are one of the more important determinants of, of on what they select in the future, whether they, they decide to uh, select a career or studying science and so on. So that's why it is important. As I said earlier, there's actually not so much evidence on, on compare on comparing concrete and abstract representations, but there's some, and our colleagues from Anna Tapola and, and, and colleagues from Helsinki and actually Mariana Vermans from, from Turku, they, they used our simulation environment, or they actually uh, used the same environment as I saw this learning results earlier. And what they found is that uh, in this concrete condition, uh, they measured pupils' interest three times during learning. And, and uh, we can see that with concrete, the interest goes up, whereas with this concreteness fading, it, there is a kind of declining trend. So, so that is an indication that, that actually this concrete representations might be also more, more engaging. As the whole 
here is also that we, like I said, that we have actually we have also data from ninth ninth grade students. But here, so here we can start also. So this is combined result from both learning environments. So we can see that this is especially engaging on elementary school level, and then it goes a bit interest goes a bit low, a bit down on on the secondary level. Whereas the learning, there's a clear, so this is pre-test and this is post-test. So, so this seems to be kind of the same simulation environment seems to be quite effective in, in different, or oh, there's a clear progress and once they become older, but of course here, this might be related to interest by their outcomes do not go any more higher on eighth grade. And I think this is also interesting from the developmental point of view. Also, if you look at the learning time curve, that uh, from fourth graders, it takes something like 85 minutes to complete all these circuit assignments that we have, whereas from eighth graders, it takes less than 60 minutes to complete those. Uh, for my final slide before uh, co conclusions is also to emphasize and not to forget that it's not only about these representations, but the pedagogy around these representations that are, are important. So <clears throat> this is an excerpt of from, from the worksheets that we use in our studies and maybe to emphasize that in the beginning of each worksheet, we activate their prior knowledge. So before they build anything, we activate their prior knowledge. So we ask them to predict what happens and then they test those. And then we ask them also to make some conclusions about those. So, so they need to be guided. Then uh, to kind of wrap up some, I don't have a, like based on, based on my presentation, I don't have really like definite answers because I, I think there's a, I would say that regarding different kind of representations, the evidence is, I would say overall inconclusive. But regarding the question, whether we should use concrete or abstract representations, <clears throat> I would say that depends on the learning goal. And as we have seen also on the experience or age of learners. Then the question of single or multiple, I would say that the evidence suggests that in case of static representations, it seems that multiple representations produce better learning outcomes than single representations. But then in case of dynamic representations such as the, our own study, it seems that the signal, this intermediate or semi-concrete representation may actually be enough. But also to, when to decide whether to decide you use single or multiple representations, age may be a factor. And I think that this is a complex topic because I think younger students, they may be unable to connect multiple representations. But then there are also <clears throat> other research which shows that once your expertise grows, you may actually also, you don't maybe, you may not also, um, you may not either benefit from multiple representations because one representation is enough. You are able to deal things or identify what is, for instance, with single concrete representations, you may be able to identify uh, what is relevant and what is not relevant. Uh, then I would also say that if you kind of get, if, if the evidence suggests that the, using multiple or single produce approximately equally good learning outcomes, or let's say that single representation produces good enough uh, outcomes, uh, I would say then it would be preferable to use a single representation because overall it contains less risk and, and is from the pedagogical point of view or from teacher's point of view, it's also easier to implement. Then the question sequential or parallel, that means that 
if you you should use first one representation and then change to other or have them both or this parallel means that to use them use both representations at the same time i would say that there has not re really been uh, good comparison studies so there's uh, inconclusive evidence but as i have as I have said, and also I think this Kaminski, these replications of this Kaminski's results, they kind of illustrate these two last points that in all cases, pedagogy and selection of representations has a major role. And also that if, if you want to establish learning and transfer effects, you should have a broad scope of measurement. So, no, so not focusing only on, on abstract understanding of abstract representations but but you should have as broad scope of measurement as possible then uh, fi my final slide some future directions and open questions uh, i overall feel that this this technological innov innovations they they have a lot of potential so that's why i think that this computer-based dynamic representations they have a lot of potential because they can simultaneously act as kind of somewhere in between concrete and abstract representations so 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 then you don't need to think of necessarily multiple representations but then there are also multiple open questions so different learners if we have different learners should we have same or different representations support them so what fits to one learner does that fit to other representation uh, to, to another learner and then to what uh, i think overall i think the these results are like they don't illustrate or they don't depict a very clear picture so my question would be that to what extent the results of using different representations are domain generic or are they domain specific then i think very like um, more specific question and i think challenge regarding this concreteness fading or the sequential use of multiple representations when when to transform from from one representation to another so i think that's a big challenge that typically it's the designer who who decides that now it's time to to change the representation but i i think in reality it is uh, uh, like uh, you should maybe measure or ask from learners that I, I have you now understood this first representation are you ready to transform to another representation and then indeed this parallel or sequential use of 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 multiple representations that's also a question that needs to be studied so that 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 was my presentation so thank you for your attention and 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 uh, also besides erno i i would like to say thanks to my close former colleague sami nurmiba and, and my current and and, and uh, long long time colleague kuul vermans from the university of turku yes thank you thank you tommy for extremely interesting and very well organized uh, presentation so that and it's uh, it's a good uh, example of, uh, of uh, what, what we uh, can learn if we uh, focus on certain research topics for a long time. Because I remember that you started that very early on when you came to the to, to university or started to, as a researcher in university. And then, then you already had a kind of uh, relatively clear ideas what you want to study. And then you have systematically continued these ideas and looked uh, in a systematic way the different aspects of, of that and uh, I, I really uh, appreciate the uh, way you, how you have been working and then see that this is this is quite quite interesting and and uh, and, and uh, fruitful 
fruitful study study program that you have been done together with your colleagues. So I I would like to start the um, joint thinking with quite quite dif difficult question. Okay. Now you have been talking about uh, external representations that uh, mm, I know that this is extremely difficult because there is not, not very much uh, kind of uh, research and then it's methodologically also very challenging. So that what is the relationship between ex uh, external and internal representation or mental, mental representation? So that, for example, if you take uh, this circuit uh, the, uh, 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 examples you have been used in, in your studies very much. Uh, when you um, when we have people who are um, kind of very advanced in thinking about electric circuits, uh, have you any idea what kind of mental representations do they have about that topic? Is it similar than the typical external representations we used, or what is the modality of, of that? Or is it so that different people have very different mental representations, even though they are able to do the same things? Yes, yeah, th that is indeed a very difficult uh, question. And I, I think that the, so the, your first part of the question kind of was that what do these experts, what kind of uh, uh, in, and I think overall that is important that uh, to that to kind of make a distinction. So I was my presentation was about this external representations, but that's uh, actually of course very important that we all have we all need to create kind of inter, internal representations when we try to understand something. And these external representations, these are kind of cognitive tools that help us mm -hmm. to think. So that is kind of offloading this kind of cognitive load uh, a bit. But uh, so I, I, I really, uh, my, my research has kind of focused mainly on, on novice learners. So I can maybe have a, some kind of idea of their internal uh, representations. But I, I actually think that you, uh, you and uh, the research that you have done on, on expertise that you would probably have a better idea of of uh, what kind of representations experts have uh, that for that i don't have a really clear picture but but i i think that uh, uh, overall i think that for learners for novice learners it is very deep i think it's very difficult to for them to kind of create and especially i think connect different kind of because i think i think that probably i my guess would be that expert have they have this kind of uh, uh they have uh, more like this uh, what would be a, i don't have a good english word but this kind of very fluent and flexible representation that they can just adapt to them to map with different kind of external representations whereas uh these more novice learners, I think uh, my kind of thinking is that they, they, they have kind of multiple internal representations and, and th then that creates this transfer problem because you are not unable to kind of connect these representations. And I think what is interesting also, if we, if you, we look at uh, also our, res for instance, our, uh, this, uh, Re results that they they show that uh, that even though they students learned with uh, with uh, the semantic representations the, the, with the simulations their scores were actually in the post as they were higher with uh, this realistic representation kind of real like representation so mm -hmm. that indicates that they are not able to connect the representations there. And then also like what I showed that is uh, now I don't remember, but I saw this one newer replication studies of Kaminsky study. <coughs> their results showed also that those that learned this, this abstract or generic condition, their actually transfer scores were the highest in, in uh, concrete representation. So I think that overall, uh, especially for novice learners, I think this, 
our internal representations are, I would say, are relatively concrete and, and attached to kind of real physical objects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, it's uh, related to very general also kind of uh, epistemic questions that uh, 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 where do we get the abstract knowledge? Does it because there's this inductive uh, uh, tradition who uh, it has been very strong in the history history that uh, we, we see concrete examples in the world and then based on several uh, examples then we generalize the idea, but there is also the more rationalist idea that uh, in order to see this kind of uh, principles in concrete things, we already have to have uh, uh, at least uh, uh, some uh, abstract ideas of, of the thing. We, we wrote uh, 25 years or something uh, uh, ago, uh, ago uh, with Stella Nulls on a paper of that where we looked look these relationships and uh, and it's I, I think it's still still valid uh, discussion about the relationship between concrete experience and abstract knowledge and where the abstract knowledge is coming coming from. But uh, then one one important issue uh, which I have been thinking when I have been looking your studies and other, other studies in this this field uh, that is the kind of relationship between what happens in one particular experiment when when they work for example one hour or one and a half hour whatever but you were thinking or then the more long lasting uh, learning so that uh, uh, it can be that what what happens in in more long term learning is somewhat different and then maybe the kind of uh, uh, not only this concrete experience with <clears throat> with the different uh, representations, but, but also this kind of verbal uh, guidance um, by teachers is more important in long, or uh, has to be taken also into account. It's, it's so that there are many, many elements which has an effect on the long-term learning, not, not only what this concrete experience with different representations, but, but then uh, also some other activities and also the discourses with with um, teachers and, and more ex um, experienced people or more, more knowledgeable people and also with parents, uh, with, uh, with peers about these issues. Uh, but in, in any of your studies, have I, I think that you have also studies where you have looked this um, peer interaction when they have been working working with this representation. Can you say something about that? Because I think that that's well, yeah, we have uh, looked at it several times, but we haven't actually ever pop like, well, the, I, I, even though I showed some trend, uh, example of these transcripts uh, that, yes, we have analyzed, but not really like, I think it would be because indeed our, in our studies, students always work in pairs because that is a, uh, First reason is that <clears throat> that is a common practice in, in, in Finnish science classroom, but the another is that these are quite challenging topics and we think that especially these weaker students uh, that, uh, that they benefit from collaboration that if, if they if put working alone, they might kind of lose their interest entirely. But I, I think, uh, so I, I don't really like have a, <laughs> have a clear or good answer but of course th there is a lot of kind of uh, there is a lot of uh, variation and i think uh, i i don't i not so much about the pair uh, interaction but overall interaction during the during learning i think it's very difficult to tell from that because sometimes you have for instance pair that seems to be so I think Richard Meyer has this nice uh, distinction between cognitive and behavioral activity. So mm -hmm. I think some students, they may, or some pairs, they may seem to be kind of behaviorally highly active, but then when you measure their learning outcomes afterwards, you can see really like that they have been mainly behaviorally active. 
and not kind of really like cognitively active. So they have actually learned a little. So I think that's also partially why, why the relationship between interest and learning outcomes, it's, at, it's, it's not clear. And I think it's definitely not linear. And I think th there are these, should I call them outliers or what? But, uh, yes, yes. but these students that so high interest, but they don't learn much from this. Yes, mm -hmm. yes and I, I think this is a kind of a very important uh, important comment you you made. Because, uh, particularly if we, we think the future future development of science science learning, because uh, even though when we organize these experiments, it it makes sense that we we have. Uh, uh, there's the specific materials and then student pairs work with that and there's no no other uh, uh, input on that process on that time and then we have looks what happens but then in in teaching I, I i think that that's that is something which we have learned from science laboratory works in general that uh, often this uh, this kind of behavioral activity is very superficial if there is a very strong support from from teachers, which helps them to to really apply the uh, to, to the kind of this uh, to to try to think conceptually what they are doing, and okay, we can use Meyer's term cognitive activity in uh, in doing doing that. And uh, now, so far, I, I think that uh, your uh, studies have been without the guidance. Is it so? Yes. Oh, yes, mostly that. Uh, yes, mostly that. We, our well, actually, we have one recent, uh, one uh, quite recent study where we actually, uh, because I think that is a kind of step, a sort of step when you develop your research. That the step was at first you want to have your kind of control. That what is kind of, uh, I would say, ex authentic uh, laboratory setting in a sense that we give the instructions so actually the worksheets serve as instructions but mm -hmm. yes but now we are kind of moving towards kind of actually giving teach so we kind of give those to actual teachers so that how would they use those because I think that is the kind of the end goal to have something that is usable also for teachers yes yes and of course for of course for controlling these designs, it has been very good solution to have these written uh, written instructions. But then, uh, of course, the limitation of them is that uh, this, these are not interactive, so that they is not that feedback elements included, which is often which is often very important for for supporting supporting the the cognitive or the conceptual understanding during the during the process and helping students to. To focus their attention to mm. the same issues, the kind of shared attention between teachers and students in in doing doing that. Maybe in in uh, if you're planning the future future studies, that would be uh, one aspect you can focus on to look in, uh, the the uh, teacher guidance more as a kind of interactive, part, not not just as, uh, as kind of. Uh, previously made instructions what, what students have to do and maybe particularly focus on, on the questions that how to guide students' attention to relevant aspects of, of, uh, of the simulations and, and also the concrete, concrete materials. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and I, I think a bit related to that, that, that tends like the, the now, like going back to like a couple of questions back that you ask about this interaction uh, or this kind of, um, I think the question was a bit related to this pair interaction yes. or this, but I think overall, I, I think they pay, still play a very important role that and I think the interaction comes from the, so I think you have the interaction with the external representation, but then you have also this interaction and collaboration between pairs. And I think in some cases, I think those are interesting cases that where students have different views. Uh, I think the, typically the best case is that if you have a two kind of motivated students and 
one has kind of more or less correct conceptions and the other one has some misconceptions that mm. that the, your first feedback comes fr from comes from the representations that that is in conflict with your view but we have also <coughs> from the video data we also see that you are still doubting that am i start now misunderstanding something or why my kind of this my internal representation is in conflict with the outcomes of this simulation so external mm -hmm. representation but then you can get the confirmation from your pair that actually i think that this is correct that what you get from the so in that sense i think that there is this kind of triangle yes sure cheers it seems seems very very interesting and and maybe this kind of uh, aspects the uh, the bear interaction and and maybe uh, bears having a little bit different uh, prior knowledge or different beliefs <clears throat> uh, makes makes these processes more interesting um, because otherwise it's possible what is uh, particularly in, in this kind of individual work would be very easily the case that uh, uh, the students are in a way playing the simulation, this term which has been used in simulation studies, that because um, many, many of the computer simulations uh, in the, are attractive from, from the point of view of just playing without any mm -hmm. visual uh, interpretations of what is happening, but that's uh, just uh, to look at these uh, all kinds of uh, fun functionalities and what fancy fancy effects can be mm -hmm. introduced and so on do, do you have any observations of this kind of uh, playing the simulation phenomenon in uh, yeah I, I think that happens well that happens quite uh, like what we have learned that you need to give some let's say five minutes for students in the beginning but uh, because what, what, what they want to do in the beginning they want to blow up the bulb so mm -hmm. they want to put. Uh, so they want to. So that's their first interest. And then the other is that they put the, the screen full of bulbs and see what happens. But uh, I think that our our worksheets and the instructions are kind of helpful in that that uh, mm -hmm. that they kind of focus the, the 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 students' attention towards the the kind of actual topic. But then I think I also want to mention that this, <clears throat> this uh, especially this real and virtual circuits that what we have used in parallel, that I think that is also quite good example of that. Mm -hmm. When you have multiple representations and, and if you are able to kind of uh, set, set uh, kind of have a setting where the students really focus because I think what is interesting there that we have all first asked students to build a virtual circuit and then they clearly use that as a point of reference they really want to succeed in building the corresponding real circuit and I think that is something that really is making them to kind of focus that you are not because with virtual in virtual environments they know from games and and such that anything is possible so you just create something but i think it's it becomes kind of more serious when you mm -hmm. when you try to apply the same thing with real real equipment so i i think that from the point of view of learning i think that is also that that makes them really like focus and they try to understand like yes, yes. i saw the quickly examples mm -hmm. that there, I think it's actually good that you have they have these little discrepancies between measurements between virtual circuit and, and real circuit because then you are forced to think that and kind of resolve the conflict and that you can't I think that if you have only a simulation it's more like linear progression. Sure, sure. Uh, yes, and also in, in then pedagogical practices, also in these more long-term pr uh, processes, it would be possible to to use them parallel so that uh, when you are planning some concrete experiments with concrete materials, you first have to uh, uh, use the simulation uh, as a planning tool, which helps you to really plan what you have to take into account when you you uh, you make the concrete uh, experiment or concrete sim uh, uh, yes concrete experiment with with some physical yes yes. 
Okay, thank you everyone at this point and thank you for participation and thank you especially Tommy uh, for your really interesting uh, talk and for your discussion together and I welcome you in about a month to the next uh, Erno Lehtinen online colloquium in which we will have Andreas Gegenfürtner um, and then we will have also Emmanuel Akpa uh, this uh, spring left and hopefully Jake McMullen as well. And that's my secret hope that is uh, revealed now. So thank you everyone and uh, see you again in Kellogg's.